Morning. Hello, and welcome to Wi-Fi at Work. I'm Ellen Satterwhite, for those of you who don't know me, Vice President at the Glen Echo Group, and I'm thrilled that you all have joined us for another edition of our Wi-Fi at Work digital event series, hosted by Wi-Fi Forward and today with Citizens Against Government Waste. A quick overview about us. Wi-Fi Forward is a coalition working to make more spectrum available for unlicensed and shared use for everything from Wi-Fi to Bluetooth and CBRS to telemedicine and distance learning. Joining us today, Citizens Against Government Waste is a private, nonpartisan, nonprofit organization representing more than 1 million members and supporters nationwide. Its mission is to eliminate waste, mismanagement, and inefficiency in the federal government. And this week, we are very excited to bring you a conversation between the FCC's newest commissioner, Nathan Symington, and Deborah Collier, Vice President of Policy and Government Affairs at Citizens Against Government Waste. But first, some housekeeping. For the sake of time, we won't be accepting questions during the webinar with the chat function. But if you have questions for our speakers, please email my colleague, Ann Keeney, at a k e e n e y at glenechogroup.com or info at wififorward.org, and we can connect you with the right people to help. After the webinar, we'll be uploading the video to YouTube and circulating it via email. Um, so if you've missed anything, you can catch up. But without further ado, I'd like to introduce Deb Collier, the moderator for today's event. Deb serves as Vice President of Policy and Government Affairs for CAGW, where she manages the policy and government affairs personnel and established the technology and telecom portfolio. Deb has co-authored two books and several issue briefs and reports relating to government IT, cloud computing, and spectrum. I can confirm that Deb is prolific in writing and talking and um, keeping me uh, in the loop and updated, and it's, it's such a wonderful partner for us, so we are so excited to have her here. Prior to CAGW, she spent 24 years at the House of Representatives in congressional offices, and most recently as the Republican Legislative Director for the House Committee on Veterans Affairs. So without further ado, Deb, over to you. Thanks, Ellen. I'm really delighted to be here today to talk about one of my really all-time favorite topics, spectrum policy. And I'm pleased to be able to do so with FCC Commissioner Nathan Symington. Nathan Symington was nominated to serve as a commissioner of the FCC by President Trump and was confirmed by the Senate in 2020. Commissioner Symington brings both private and public sector experience to the commission. Previously, he served as senior advisor at NTIA, where he worked on many aspects of telecommunications policy, including spectrum allocation and planning, broadband access, and the US government's role in the internet. Prior to joining the commission, he was senior counsel to Bright Star Corporation, an international mobile device services company, and was also an attorney in private practice. Commissioner Simington, thank you for joining us. I'll now hand things over to you for some brief remarks, and then we'll get into our conversation. Thank you very much, Deb. Uh, good morning, and I'm delighted to be here to discuss spectrum policy with you folks today. I look forward to a fruitful discussion. Given recent advances in technology, particularly the increasing deployment of IoT devices, I think a carefully crafted coherent spectrum policy is crucial in today's marketplace, which is becoming increasingly reliant on wireless technology. This is why I am a committed proponent of outreach to all federal agencies with a stake in future spectrum allocation decisions. From my perch at the FCC, I feel that coordination with the other executive branch agencies is key to a coherent national policy that allows private industry to succeed without encumbering existing uh, stakeholders in the executive branch. I believe that better coordination and stronger relationships will help us identify future commercial spectrum, whether that be allocated for licensed, unlicensed, or shared use. There are obviously significant public interest benefits to ensuring access to licensed and unlicensed spectrum allocations across low, mid, and high bands. So for this reason, I think the FCC has a central role to play in looking at increased spectral efficiency and also at the removal of superannuated regulatory burdens across all allocations. So it's imperative for the commission to enable both unlicensed and licensed users to make the most of what they already have. 
In the unlicensed spectrum realm, we are starting to see that the commission's six gigahertz decision set the stage for regulatory actions elsewhere, as countries increasingly realize the great benefits of low cost connectivity delivered by Wi-Fi. As a result, Wi-Fi 6 is becoming rapidly adopted in six gigahertz and other bands across the world. According to a study conducted by the Wi-Fi Alliance, the global value of Wi-Fi is estimated to be $3.3 trillion with a T in 2021, with an increase to $4.9 trillion by 2025. When you factor in consumer and business communication needs, technology developments, access to additional spectrum, and the economic impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. Given that Wi-Fi, 5G, and other wireless technologies encompass an ever increasingly broad swath of the economy, I think it's imperative that we continue to get spectrum policy right by anticipating the needs of industry and consumers and the evolution of technology in the wireless space. And with that, I'm happy to jump into the Q&A. Great, thank, thank you so much, Commissioner Simington. So now we're going to, as you mentioned, dive into the fireside chat portion of our um, discussion. Um, you and I both share a commitment to limited government and especially telecommunications regulation. Unlicensed bands are the least regulated of any spectrum assignment or allocation. Do you think this light touch regulatory approach has been part of why unlicensed spectrum and technologies like Wi-Fi have been so successful? Yes, Deb, I do. I think that the FCC's light touch approach to unlicensed bands has had a lot to do with uh, success in those bands. The whole idea of an unlicensed spectrum itself, so allowing for broad use within an interference framework, has driven innovation in unlicensed bands by permitting scientific and engineering imagination broad freedom to explore and invent. Unlicensed spectrum allows and will allow for IoT and industrial applications to flourish as well by providing access to spectrum for technologies and industries that might not otherwise be able to afford to participate in a spectrum auction for the purpose of deployment, may not wish to operate over an entire PEA, and also um, allows new technological standards to emerge where there's no obvious license holding party. So I think these are some of the reasons why unlicensed spectrum has got to be a significant part of the spectrum menu going forward. Okay, so speaking of this relationship between licensed and unlicensed, there are constant reminders about 5G networks and the speeds they promise. And something that I've often said is that 5G needs both licensed and unlicensed spectrum to be fully realized. And they're actually even more interconnected than one might think. Studies estimate that 74% of traffic over 5G networks will be offloaded to Wi-Fi next year. Do you expect that interconnectedness to continue into the future? Well, Deb, there's, there's no question that Wi-Fi has become the definitive uh, last step technology and that it, as such, Wi-Fi is interfacing with, uh, with huge amounts of, of other connectivity technologies, whether those be uh, wired or wireless, um, in order to permit uh, extensive connectivity within, um, within appropriate environments. That said, there will certainly be a certain amount of commercial mobile 5G traffic that's offloaded onto Wi-Fi, but, um, but as well, we're also looking at a potential transition where uh, commercial wireless traffic begins to blur the boundaries uh, between wireless mobility and home broadband. Next generation networks and technologies such as Wi-Fi 6 will only continue to become uh, more important in interconnection as we move into the world of IoT, but there doesn't, we don't need to look at this as being a rivalry. Uh, the nature of 5G technology, particularly as deployed over millimeter wave spectrum with, with uh, robust throughput that that permits, is designed to support the, the types of use that mobile providers in the past, in some cases, relied on Wi-Fi to support. Um, so, for example, high-def streaming and video conferencing um, may, uh, may prove, in some cases, to benefit from, uh, from this higher throughput once there's sufficient infrastructure in place for it, which may take some time. So... I guess what I would say is I do expect interconnection to continue. I expect the interconnectivity model to continue to change. Um, obviously, Wi-Fi isn't going anywhere. It's just picking up speed. And in keeping with the idea of not prejudging technologies that's inherent to light touch regulation, I, and also recognizing the alacrity of Wi-Fi vendors in stepping up to support Wi-Fi 6, I expect to see Wi-Fi continue to develop as well. So. Um, we, at the commission, I think we have to be a little bit humble about what we can see in our foggy crystal balls 
And this is, this is one of these cases where we can say that there will be more connectivity, that Wi-Fi will be a central part of that connectivity. And beyond that, we sort of have to let engineering and the markets uh, take up the ball. Okay, well, thank you for that. Um, you know, another swath of spectrum, you've mentioned six gigahertz and some other bands, but another swath of spectrum, the 5.9 gigahertz band was a huge, big bipartisan victory at the FCC. The unanimous vote last November frees up 45 megahertz of spectrum that will create a new 160 megahertz channel for Wi-Fi and other unlicensed use while maintaining 30 megahertz for the connected cards of the future. Even before that order was adopted, the commission made it possible for wireless internet service providers to use that band to provide broadband to rural customers. It was so important during the pandemic that they were able to do this. And that increased their bandwidth by up to 50%. So, not to have you look into that magical crystal ball or anything, but what do you think comes up next for this band? Um, Deb, that was one of the last major votes before I joined. It's, it's too bad I didn't get to vote for it though, because, um, because I, I favor this. Um, I'd like to see what was adopted in the November order to remain in place and to uh, come to fruition. Uh, so it, it allowed immediate access for unlicensed indoor operations, specified low power levels across the portion of the band allocated for unlicensed use. And then the new rules also allow for outdoor unlicensed operations through the FCC's existing uh, regulatory process which has to be coordinated with the NTIA to protect federal incumbents. So it remains to be seen if the DSRC industry and the Department of Transportation will prevail in rolling back some of these changes. I certainly hope that's not the case. I haven't heard any rumblings at the commission, but of course uh, you never know. It's worth noting that this entire thing is in a sense a conflict between two different parts of the executive branch. So proponents of the uh, retaining the DSRC allocation argued that there was already a very large allocation for Wi-Fi in the five gigahertz band and, and the, that, that additional portion was not needed. Um, but I think what that leaves out is that uh, so much of the five gigahertz band from Wi-Fi and other unlicensed perspective is encumbered by coordination obligations and power level restrict restrictions. And as such, it's never been a focus of vendor support because it's so much less capable. So that's part of what makes this also difficult. Um, on the one hand, you've got uh, you've got encumbrances coming from one federal agency. On the other hand, you have an unlicensed portion claimed by a, a separate federal agency. And so Wi-Fi is, and other unlicensed technologies are a bit caught in the middle. I think it's important for all of us going forward to imagine us as um, no longer building in greenfield. Instead, now it's like we're um, now it's like we're real estate developers putting up buildings in Paris or New York. No matter where you want to build, you're going to have to deal with prior efforts. There's a lot of history. The real estate is really expensive. So um, that said, uh, again, I know that, that uh, Wi-Fi vendors moved with alacrity to pick up this additional bandwidth, enable, um, enable broader channels, and deliver superior performance. And I hope they continue. Okay. Um, I, we, we hope this in, it continues as well. Um, Wi-Fi technology was in invented here in the US and is dominated by American companies, unlike many other telecommunications technologies. Some foreign countries and companies have negative views toward Wi-Fi and at the last World Radio Communication Conference, China and Huawei tried to block Wi-Fi from the six gigahertz band. Do you think this is going to happen again? And what do you recommend that we do to ensure continued American leadership in this field? Well, Deb, as a Canadian um, immigrant myself, I want to, I, I just want to touch on this, this first bit about Americans uh, not having sufficient inventiveness in telecom technology. Of course, as everyone is aware, all of the fundamentals of modern telecommunications were born in the United States. Well, a, the, a vast majority. So whether we're talking about the transistor or the radio or the cellular phone or the communication satellite or a host of other technologies. I'm actually reading a book about Bell Labs to one of my kids right now. And um, on every page, there's a Nobel Prize winner or a major invention. So, uh, so Americans have a tendency um, Americans have a tendency to low self-esteem in some of these areas. We, Americans have got to buck up. American advances in telecommunications have been fantastic in the past. They will be fantastic in the future. And Wi-Fi is an American success story. Nevertheless, there are many countries, including in the EU, which have 
only dedicated uh, a portion of the lower uh, six gigahertz band for Wi-Fi or who haven't taken the decision at all. So clearly the world is at a pivotal place for the six gigahertz band. Um, obviously, uh, the Chinese government is under significant pressure from Huawei, among others, to find more licensed 5G spectrum and is thus still eyeing the six gigahertz band for that. Um, it seems very improbable that they would not uh, raise this issue at WRC 23 and, and push for their point of view. So American leadership will depend on whether we can convince the EU countries and others that have dedicated the lower portion of the band for Wi-Fi to stay the course with regard to the rest of the band. Stressing the urgent need for global spectrum harmonization in international fora, including uh, WRC 23, would be the best strategy for ensuring the US approach is adopted in other regions. And I think a key point to emphasize when we do this, and one that I personally would like to make whenever possible, is that using six gigahertz for mobility forecloses use of advanced Wi-Fi operations. So as a vital and heavily used last mile technology, there's a significant trade-off in doing so that may promote in the short term adoption of additional wireless mobility, but would squander existing backhaul investments and give up on the potential for future developments under Wi-Fi 6 and further standards. Nonetheless, victory for this argument is not a foregone conclusion and further advocacy is clearly needed. Okay. Um so the FCC, um, the FCC had a huge success story in opening up what we were just talking about, the six gigahertz band for unlicensed use. But this year we've seen many other countries, and, and this year we've seen many other countries following suit, including Chile, Mexico, South Korea, Korea, and the EU. What are your thoughts on the six gigahertz band and its potential to supercharge the next generation of Wi-Fi? Deb, in my view, the more countries we see adopt six gigahertz for Wi-Fi, the better chance we'll have for adoption of new and next-gen Wi-Fi technologies across a broad range of applications, including industrial IoT and manufacturing. Just as with 5G, we have to make the case that beyond the direct benefits to the consumer, there are significant benefits for efficiency, logistics, uh, manufacturing, agriculture, public safety. The same arguments need to be made for Wi-Fi. These types of applications have the most potential to drive the ecosystem for Wi-Fi technology into an even wider range of uses than we already see. So yes, I do think six gigahertz for Wi-Fi uh, appears to be in a, a good direction for technology and for the country. And again, this is an argument that should be advanced uh, throughout international fora to enable the benefits of uh, these technological advances to be impactful worldwide. And now, you know, we've, we've been talking a lot about a lot of heavy hitting questions. I'm going to close us out with a little bit more of a fun question, if you don't mind. Um, Americans stream enormous amounts of video using their Wi-Fi connections every single day. And I'm among those many Americans that do that. This month, I've been rewatching the Star Trek Enterprise series and the Harry Potter movies I just finished the last movie in the Harry Potter series last night. What's in your queue? Well, here you get to find out just just what a just just how much of a nerd I am. So uh, my uh, I'm going to start with what else is going on in my family. My wife has been streaming Cold Dark, really enjoys that. Uh, she's been streaming The Crown, really enjoys that. For me, I'm usually streaming audio. So um, so in particular. Um, in particular, in memory of uh, the great American composer, uh, uh, Rzhevsky, who just, just died uh, this past week, um, I was listening to his, um, to his uh, variations on the, the people uh, united will never be defeated. So um, it's, it's quite a complex, difficult, modernist piece. And thus, I find it um, gets me in the right mood to do spectrum policy. Wow. OK, well, that's all I have for you today, Commissioner. Thank you so much for joining me today for this conversation. And now at this point, I'll hand things back over to you, Ellen, for some final notes. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Commissioner Symington. Thank you, Deb. I think uh, if I miss, I love digital events, but I miss the opportunity to um, clap and to talk with one another afterwards. And I am sure that folks would have enjoyed um, having that. But in, in uh, lieu of that, I will just say, maybe as a point of personal privilege, um, Commissioner Symington, I could talk to your wife about Poldark because I need somebody to, to um, obsess about that 
with me, but I'll, I'll put that aside. Um, thank you to all of you out there who joined us today for our Wi-Fi at Work series. Stay tuned for the video from this discussion, as well as information on future webinars and uh, events, and hopefully, cross fingers, uh, in-person events coming soon. Again, if you have any questions for our presenters or any questions about Wi-Fi Forward, please feel free to email either my colleague Ann Keeney at akeeney at glenechogroup.com or info at wififorward.org. You can also visit our website, wififorward.org. And of course, please follow us on Twitter at wififorward. We hope to see you all next time. And thank you again, Commissioner Symington and Deb.